next speaker is uh, Senja Selimovic. She's a neurobiologist and she's now coordinating the SOSIP uh, project of SPHN, which is a large national project about oncology um, and personalized medicine. Uh, a really relevant topic and um, she will uh, explain us her experiences when she established such a multi-center research project uh, with a special difficulty, which is the exchange of genomic data. So we are uh, expecting a really interesting presentation and uh, stage is yours. Thanks for the introduction and um, hello everyone. Um, I Today I want to um, talk from a, a personal point of view and um, uh, try to um, summarize the experiences that uh, we had in our project while establishing um, a multi-center research project and um, getting all these ethical agreements and ethical requirements done while also trying to work with genomic data. So um, I first of all want to briefly introduce who we are um, because this matters for all these contracts and for the ethics. The Swiss Molecular Pathology Breakthrough Platform that I will refer to as SOSIP is a driver project by the, uh, financed by the SPHN, um, one of many drivers. And uh, the participating centers are basically all the university hospitals in Switzerland, a pilot cantonal hospital of Basel Land in Wiesthal. And then we have also um, the centers at the universities where our staff sits, mainly the uh, computational biologists. Um, these are University of Bern, DBMR, and ETH Zurich. Um, so it's almost like the whole country in one project, at least on a university uh, hospital level. It's many participants, many collaborators, and a small team. The SOSIP project aims to um, collect the information from all these hospitals and centers on uh, NGS assays that are used in oncology, um, take all these NGS assays, standardize the data, and build up one genomic pipeline that um, everyone can use and that generates a standardized genomics um, output in form of a molecular pathology report. So this task is um, a really complicated and a huge one because when SOSIP started, absolutely nothing was standardized. We had not even the information on uh, what NGS assays are used, what machines are used in the hospitals, um, what is coming up um, to be done for us as researchers. And um, standardizing genomic data is a, a complicated task for itself because every cancer is different, every NGS assay is different. Uh, one cannot just build one NGS pipeline and put all these information into it, analyze it and have one report. So what we had to do is build several NGS pipelines that are um, in so-called containers. And these pipelines talk to each other and they can handle all the input um, from the hospital and genera uh, generate um, a more or less standardized output. The um, last aim of SOSIP um, is to not only make this system of NGS analysis um, stable and working, but also to extend it for a broader use in um, not only research, but also in clinics. So you can imagine how huge the project is. And um, I will now talk about what we needed to do on an admin level to make this project start, more or less. If you look at the Swiss Ethics website, they have these um, instructions on how to proceed with a multicentric study, what the requirements for a submission are, 
And um, you really do not need to read this picture and this diagram there. It's just to, to um, be like a visual um, um, input. Uh, but the main take home message is that, is that um, research projects that involve multiple centers um, have one lead ethics committee and some other ethics committees that are then also ad added to the um, to the project submission. The uh, lead committee um, needs to sit in the same canton as the project PI. And then we need to submit the whole documentation electronically via the BASIC portal. It's a business administration for ethics committees portal. There are templates from Swiss ethics, and um, there are such information as um, the project lead needs to uh, translate documents or um, that centers added to the project um, have to be approved as a substantial amendment and so on. Um, basically, what you read there looks more um, or it looks easier than it really is, because all the requirements that are essentially needed are much more than that. What we were facing in the very beginning is that um, we had our lead committee uh, or lead ethics committee sitting in Canton Bern and four additional eth uh, ethics committees had to be involved because our centers and our participating hospitals sit in these cantons. So it's five ethics committees from the start. And the real requirements, speaking from a research point of view and the administrative um, point of view are um, much more than that. It's You need to write an ethics protocol that um, absolutely everyone of all of your participants agrees on. And then you can imagine um, how difficult this is if you have five, six hospitals, um, many computational biologists, you have the SPHN, everyone needs to agree on one protocol. And the protocol is not just a simple protocol, it's more than 30 pages, it's a project plan, it's a synopsis. Uh, one needs to agree on handling of data, um, on consent statuses, on um, data safety, security, um, uh, what kind of analysis are possible, how many patients or cases can we handle, or um, how many cases will we at all get from all the centers? What kind of NGS formats are there out there? And so on. It, it's almost an impossible task to preview all these information um, while submitting the, the ethics. Um, the whole protocol, the whole documentation, of course, needs to meet formal requirements. Um, every protocol version um, is um, has to be signed by everyone. <laughs> so there are several protocol versions necessary mo uh, many times um, of chasing signatures and so on. And then there is a whole list of documents that need to be submitted in addition to the ethics pro uh, protocol. Um, for instance, uh, CVs from the participants. Um, there are several texts for the basic online submission that need to be written carefully because each word you write there can be <laughs> the one important um, uh, requirement that is not met. There are several signature pages that have to be handed in a version many times, as I said. Uh, what is also um, mostly not uh, seen as a, a task or as, a, as an additional job is that one needs to have all the addresses of all the contacts, all the responsibles at all sites, the legal departments and so on. You need to know who to contact to get things done. Then, of course, a cover letter and um, the most frightening thing that Julia just presented are the agreements and the contracts that are necessary. Um, in the end, it comes down to a lot of time, a lot of nerves, and a lot of work for the administrative staff, but also for the researchers. Um, I will not talk about agreements. We had a, a presentation just before me that um, presented this in, in detail, 
But there are several agreements out there from data transfer and use agreements, material transfer agreements, and so on. And um, it's important to figure out what agreement you need um, to get the agreements done. And again, to have all the partners agree on agreements, because if you have a multi-center study, you cannot just come up with 20 agreements. You need one agreement for all. And um, why is this a, a huge, or why was this a huge hurdle for us is because everything that Julia presented before me wasn't in place when SOSEP started. So the SPHN, the help desk, the biomed IT, all these things that are now working uh, were being built up in parallel as SOSEP started. And we had to start with um, agreements that we did are on our own with the hospitals. And these agreements were, for instance, DUAs, MTAs, it's several different agreements. Each hospital has their own. And all these agreements became invalid from the time on when SPHN invented the templates and the central DTUAs and so on. So it was a double effort for us. But thankfully, they did this job because everyone that comes after us will not have to go through this again. So I want to start with a timeline on how SOSIP managed the ethics application for these um, university hospitals and the cantonal hospital. And the story goes way back to 2019. In the very beginning, we started with collecting all the data for the project plan, for the documents that are necessary to be submitted for the ethics and so on. So um, it's a lot of um, Zoom meetings, a lot of in-person meetings back then. And um, the important thing is that when SOSIP started and when the funding from the SPHN was granted, it was not a requirement to already have the ethics approval in place. It, it was also simply not possible back then because um, it was um, it had everything had to be planned in the beginning. So uh, what we were facing was a situation that we had the funding, we had to start working on NGS data and start building up an infrastructure but our hands were tied because we had no ethics approval, we had no DTUAs, and absolutely every day began to matter. So we set up a project plan, we set up all the first documents and tried to submit the ethics approval as fast as possible. We managed to have our first version uploaded on the basic portal on April 15th and the first rejection came on April 15th, simply because they already, back then they, they um, had decided that formal requirements were not met, that um, sampling dates were not fine, that um, consent statuses were unclear and so on. It was um, a whole list of um, objections and we had to start over again, which means a new version of the ethics protocol, all signatures collected once again, um, many talks with the hospitals on consent statuses, on um, sampling dates, on an estimation of um, how many cases we can get that are fine with the legal, and ethics um, aspects and so on. The second version that we uploaded um, was um, done in May and we again got the rejection. Again, they came up with um, new details that were important to the ethics committee, such as um, software information, data management, again, sampling dates, again, consent statuses um, and you can imagine that um, when you want to start to build up a software that analyzes NGS data, then you simply do not have the full information about the software because you haven't even started working on it. And what SOSIP had to do all the time is we had to preview what we were going to do with data that we were not um, knowing um, anything about. Um, we, it, it's almost impossible to um, write a very precise um, 
project plan in this case. And what maybe needs to be said is that um, the aim of SOSIP was not to collect specific the, um, patient cohorts from uh, hospitals that were precisely defined. The aim of SOSIP was to collect as many NGS data as possible from all hospitals that are participating. So it's important to us to get more data and, and the more the better, and you cannot define numbers of cases in that case. You, you need to say we need as much data as possible, but then how do you define define what kind of data, what kind of NGS formats, and what kind of software, what kind of NGS pipelines. So um, it, it's funny, <laughs> but um, it's not impossible to do. Um, we again submitted a third version. Again, we got um, a rejection and so on. And the fourth version that we submitted in October 2019, so almost a year after the first or after the initiation of the work on the ethics, we finally got a partial acceptance. And this was a huge day, not only for SOSIP, but for all the other SPHN driver projects. Um, we were the first project that had something like that in place and that could start working with data. And um, we lost a year. <laughs> Others lost even more time. Um, the framework after the partial approval looked like this, that we finally could exchange um, genomic cancer data from the involved centers that had signed DUAs or DTUAs. Um, these were not all centers. For instance, um, Shuv Lausanne um, could not manage to sign the DTUA. They um, simply needed a lot more time. They have a lot more complicated processes in place for checking legal documents and so on. Um, within this framework, that we had, uh, we were allowed to work with up to 3,000 patients um, to work with encoded data without detailed treatment records, medication. So all the data had to be depersonalized, anonymized, and so on, handled in the most safe way possible and um, stored in the end on a local CBIO portal instance that um, only specific people collaborating with us have access to. So um, data safety was um, a huge issue and um, we had to respect a lot of rules that were all done um, provisionally because the biomed IT, again, was not in a fully working mode for us. We could not use um, the secure safe or, or um, high security data transfer methods that are now set up by the biomed IT, SIS, DCC, and so on. Um, and um, then we had to respect all the consent statuses. Um, we had certain dates to, to um, respect from all the centers and we could not collect any date, uh, data beyond that. And of course, like um, the Human um, Research Act says, we had to um, have patients who withdraw their consent, um, excluded from the study and so on. And then the last obligation that we were given by the ethics committee was that um, if anything changes to this protocol, there needs to be a new protocol version signed version by all the local PIs. And uh, we cannot work with Lausanne because there is um, no uh, legal framework in place. And if Lausanne joins the project, then we need to set up everything from uh, every legal agreement with them. And we need to have, again, a new protocol version signed by all the local PIs. And um, in the end, we would only get the final ethics approval once Lausanne signs or once we officially exclude Lausanne. So we had to work with this partial approval until we found a solution on how to include all the hospitals and how to solve all the, all the technical issues with the biomed IT and with all the data that needs to be transferred. Um, what then happened is that um, the SPHN came up with requirements after this partial approval in 2020, end of 2020, and this is two years into the project. So um, what the SPHN requested from us is to submit a full ethics approval 
including all the centers. Um, they also wanted us to use the, the templates that were set up by the SPHN. And if you remember from the beginning of my talk, we had to um, work with other separate DTUAs because SPHN DTUAs and the SPHN help desk was not in place. So now this was in place and we were required to do all the jobs once again and to set everything right. Um, we also, in the meantime, joined the Biomed IT who could now handle safe data transfers along the Biomed IT nodes. This has to be this had to be fixed in the project protocol. And um, in the end, we needed to submit all this documentation um, within a time frame of two months. And um, again, if you remember, um, for the first initial round of having a partial approval, we needed almost a year. And then we had two months to fix everything and do everything like once again. Um, luckily, with the help of people like Julia Maura and um, Frédéric Herra, Marc Villieta, and so on, we um, really managed to set up a central DTUA, including all the hospitals that are in the associate project, including the biomed IT nodes, including all our staff from the computational biology team. And the last steps were really chaotic, but um, also really successful. So what you see in this chaos here is that um, in 2019, we had DUAs with um, Bern, Zurich, Basel, and Liestal. So basically two centers were missing on these contracts. Data was flowing from three centers um, to SOSIP. Um, all these data had to be retransferred again along the Biomed IT nodes with valid central DTUAs, DTPAs. And within two months, we um, managed to set this straight. So we um, established um, SOPs for data transfer. We um, estimated precise numbers of cases that we were able to get from all the centers. We could also precisely define what NGS assays are used, what data formats are used. All the technical details could now um, finally be defined. The DTUA um, and DTPA uh, was signed in a, a extremely fast way using DocuSign. Um, in the meantime, we had figured out who the legal departments are, who the responsible persons are. We could notify these people um, ahead of time. And basically, we got this thing signed in two weeks. So um, in February 2021, we finally got the final ethics approval with fully um, legal DTUAs, DTPAs. And we had a very safe um, system of handling genomic NGS data in place. Getting this final approval in numbers looks a bit like this. Um, the project was um, is, uh, meant to um, last for three years, according to the SPHN, but we simply lost a year, not only on the ethics approval and on, on the all, all the administrative work that was to be done, but also on the COVID situation. Um, so we uh, requested a no cost funding extension uh, for a year and we um, got this no cost funding ex extension. So in the end, SOSIP was meant to last for four years. Um, we lost um, almost two years until having the partial ethics approval. Uh, what this meant for us was to that we had to do dry work of programming NGS pipelines and testing them without having data. Um, we lost two and a half years on administrative work until we received the final ethics approval and until we could really collaborate with all our partners. Um, we submitted four protocol versions with um, each on each, we had signatures from five centers, um, and we have a fifth version ongoing, and um, I will talk about this later. 
Um, we had to set up five DUAs, two MTAs, one huge central DTUA, roughly um, over 40 signatures um, from all across Switzerland, only for the, the data agreements. And we already have um, two substantial amendments and the third one um, ongoing. So um, it, it's really, uh, I'm not exagger exaggerating when I say it's a lot of work. Um, and this work blocks all the, the research that could be done, or it, it really minimizes the time that you can spend on the, the, the study you want to perform. Um, what's important to highlight for such multicentric studies um, like SOSIP is that, of course, when you work with human genomic data, you have to respect all the rules. Um, of the Human Research Act, you have to handle this data in an anonymized, depersonalized, depersonalized way. You have to have an IT infrastructure that ensures that really the safety of the data is the highest priority. Um, you cannot grant access um, to this data to anyone. You really have to have a, a core team that um, will um, work on the data. You have to have data management systems in place. It's um, a lot of infrastructure, a lot of legal aspects that need to be respected. Um, what was a huge issue for us was um, the absolutely, it was absolutely impossible to estimate numbers of cases, data formats, types of metadata ahead of time for a precise project plan that maybe would have been accepted by the ethics committee um, a lot faster. Um, we our project that was set up to um, build up infrastructure, to build up a way of standardizing such formats of standardizing genomic and molecular pathology reports. And um, in our specific case, um, it was almost impossible to come up with precise descriptions on what we are going to do because we had to learn along the way and figure it out along the way. Um, why do we have these amendments again ongoing and again a new protocol version is simply the collaboration on an international level as SOSIP developed the NGS pipeline system and the standardized uh, way of analyzing NGS data we have grown out um, uh, or grown beyond the Swiss NGS landscape and we now want to collaborate internationally uh, we would like to use international NGS um, standards that are set up by um, GA, uh, GH48 or um, ICGC Argo. But um, in our case, or in the Swiss case, so to say, um, we need either a separate ethics approval to work with international data, or we need to have a substantial amendment again. Um, and this is really um, um, sometimes frustrating because when you want, want to um, implement international standards and use international genomic data, this is not data generated from hospitals all over the world that nobody ever worked with. It's um, highly depersonalized, anonymized data that already went through several stages of standardiz standardization that has been used by several research projects and teams all over the world and it's handled in the most secure and safe way possible and some countries simply do not even need a, um, or do not even have the must of a new ethics approval for such data or such work but switzerland has this in place so again we need to um, set up a new ethics or a new substantial amendment um, it's important to highlight that each hospital has individual processes for approving legal agreements. Um, and these processes can last many months and even a year or more, and they are not the same. So some hospitals have a very fast way of approving such things, and some hospitals really have legal departments, several lawyers working on testing or on checking the agreements. And this is something one doesn't know when starting such a study um, like SOSIP. Um, and again, 
SOSIP was a project that relied on having data from the very start and um, due to not having the ethics and the legal framework in place, we could not start. So, In conclusion, um, I really do not want to, um, neither to sugarcoat it nor to paint it all black. But, um, the reality was that so, uh, SOSIP was indeed a pioneer among all the SPHM driver projects. We managed to have the first ethics approval, the first partial and the first full one, and we managed to cover the whole research plan with this approval. So not only um, some cohorts or some uh, subsets of data, but really the whole project plan. Um, thankfully, we developed parallel working processes of um, building up NGS infrastructure, um, NGS um, analysis pipelines. We, um, in parallel, standardized um, working with genomic data, and um, this allowed us to continue with the research project. If we had to, uh, or if we had waited until everything was legally in place and ethically in place, um, after three years of SOSIP, we, uh, we would not have managed to um, ever finish the project. Um, luckily and thankfully, things are now changing, and um, I see this as a huge opportunity for all projects that come after us. Um, and uh, you have heard the talk from Julia. Now we do have um, help. There is this SPHN um, template system for the agreements. Um, the Biomed IT is working. We have um, Biomed IT regulations on working with data. The DCC is helping. There's a lot of standardization in those SOPs, in the templates. There's um, a whole support system that um, researchers can now finally use that will save them uh, a lot of time and nerves. And in the end, um, SOSEP will manage to finish successfully in March 2022, which is in a few months already. We um, have really managed to um, build up the infrastructure that was asked from us to, to be set up, to analyze genomic data and to build a system for, for Switzerland that can now be extended to other hospitals and, as well. And um, the SOSIP pilot experience, not only with NGS analysis and um, cancer genomics, but also with ethics, um, will hopefully serve as a roadmap for future similar projects. In the end, um, I want to mention all the partners or to show you briefly a picture of all the partners that we were and still are working with. And it's really a lot of people. Um, I cannot even uh, mention all the names, but um, it's the university hospital hospitals. It's um, the cantonal hospital of Baselland. It's um, a lot of um, SIB, SPH and PHRT involvement, a lot of computational biologists. And without um, the collaboration of all these people and the will um, to, to bring this um, forward, um, nothing would have been possible in the end. Um, thank you, and um, I'm open to questions. <laughs>